Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new session, uh, one of the last sessions of the Android Academy, Android Implementation Academy. Uh, in this session, we are going to talk about, um, in continuation to Jaime's session, he was talking about going mobile security implications and configuration implications. Here, we are going to see the implications in your implementation plan. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let me do this. Yes. And, and then uh, by the end of this session, what we would like to share with you is information on best practices on configuring and testing uh, DHIS2, uh, to know what to look into while you are acquiring devices, uh, the different alternatives that you have for installing the application, to know what is a mobile device management uh, software, and then also to understand the implications on your server uh, infrastructure. And then we will have a small online quiz that we always like to have. So I will be covering actually only the first part and, and maybe second, and Jaime is going to cover the second half or two thirds of the, of the rest of the session. So, um, what we are going to share here is not rocket science and is probably things that you already do because most of you here are experienced implementers. So we are just repeating and repeating uh, things that you might know because when you implement uh, and when you have mobile devices in an implementation, let's say in simple that everything complicates a bit more because before you have one server and you keep control of your server, but now you have a replica of your server in many little devices all over your country or region, and, and that makes things a bit more complicated. So I'm going to focus first in the, in the phases of configuration and testing that you do before scale up. So these phases, what is important to remember, and the main message we want to send is that they are iterative. They, are, they go in cycles. And all the phases, internal testing, user acceptance, field testing, will keep on informing and fine tuning your configuration. You are going to keep on making changes all across this, in principle, uh, phases before scaling up. So that when you scale up, you finally uh, are, have a, a robust and reliable implementation. This is very important because, for example, this academy is a very good example. We have we have been having problems with the metadata, you could not sync, you cannot see what you're expecting to see, then we go, we change the server. But I think most of you have experienced how complicated it is to troubleshoot and to support you when what is happening is in your device and we don't really have access to it and we depend on you to tell us what the problem is. And, and, and we are all more or less sitting comfortable at our desk, our offices or homes, and we do have uh, relatively good connection. So imagine what we have had in this academy with the devices in the field used by an end user with bad connection, probably working in a rural remote area. Everything complicates very much. So these phases are very important. You have to be very rigorous and strict uh, in being in following this process for a successful implementation. So. Um, Let's go one by one. Uh, internal testing. What do we call internal testing? You might call it differently. Is is the first uh, uh, phases of your configuration is done by a very small team, probably your experts saying what they want, the subject matter experts, and then your technicians configuring. Uh, because what you are testing here is the configuration and the Android app. What can the Android app do or not? Where what is a bug? What is supported? <clears throat> How is my configuration behaving? And you are looking for your program rules, if they behave properly, if the forms look as you expect, and the data entry flow, the visual configurations that we have learned, if the indicators work as expected to. Of course, you will also find, well, hopefully not, but you could also find bugs. You could uh, think of improvements. You could think of new requirements. So how to do this? The methods and, and timings for this vary from group to group. So, but the, the common thing is that it has to be iterative. This one is very, very quick, uh, fast cycles. It goes in very fast cycles and it has to be done at the very, very beginning. Documentation is your best friend for this phase. And this slide that we are gonna keep is, these are links. You can explore all of them because 
what is supported, what is not, how to configure everything that we have said in this academy is in these documents. These are, the, this, these are links to one same document. So everything is together. Besides this one, this is different. This is for deployment. And from here down, it's for, for the app. So make sure to go back and to use the documentation. And now, once you are happy with your configuration, you move to the user acceptance test. Now you are still testing your configuration. Yes, you are still testing your visuals and icons. You want to see how the users behave to that. If it's usable, if it, if it comes out as you expected, and if they can do the tasks that they are expected to do um, in, the, in their work practices. And again, you keep learning and adjusting your configuration. You are looking for adjustments again all the time. And you can start identifying champions in your on your users, like who is going to be your are going to be your key person for for your uh, deployment. The key thing here is that it's it's done in a controlled environment. It's a short exposure. We are not deploying the solution. We are just telling them to please stop work and test this and tell us um, what they think is not necessarily integrated in work practices uh, at this moment or left for a long time. After the user acceptance test and after the changes that you might do after that, uh, you might go to the field testing uh, or pilot or however you call it. Now you are testing in the real uh, scenario and you're testing your, your protocols, you are testing the workflows, the infrastructure and architecture. You are also testing your training procedures and materials that you have prepared in the previous uh, phases. And you're looking for, again, adjustments, but you're also evaluating your solution in a real scenario, competing with the real day-to-day -day tensions, and you keep identifying champions for your, for your deployment. There is no golden rule for this, but 20, 30 users and about two months of exposing the software could give you information. It's, it's very important, the, 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 the location, the setting where you do your pilot because you should not go to the easiest location you have, but neither to the most complex. You need to challenge your, your tool, but you also need to be able to perform the pilot and learn. So maybe something in the middle. And then uh, you need, before doing this, you need to have defined how are you going to evaluate your solution? What are you be going looking at to decide if you go on rollout or if you need more basis? Uh, at this point, you also define your strategy on how you will replace. And once you have finished all this, then you will move to the scale up, um, which comes with acquisition of devices. Jaime will tell us more later, but uh, you need to decide if you are going to work with phones, with tablets, with Chromebooks. You need to configure, if not done before, your user roles and locations. And our recommendation is that you don't uh, acquire all the devices you need at the very beginning. Most likely your deployment is going to be on cascade mode in phases. So you can acquire devices slowly so that you learn and test your, your, the devices you can, and you can change it if required. Um, also implementations can, can be delayed in time for reasons that we don't control. And, and then we can have a lot of devices becoming obsolete. Um, so this is just an example of planning. You can keep it for reference of how would you acquire your devices to, to scale from 100 to 1,000 based on your impl uh, implementation plan. The training you need to define as well, if you will do training of trainers or, on, or if you will do on the job training or class-based training, all this will depend really on your project. We are just sell, telling you here things that you should consider and decide. And, and of course, we have this developed in more detail in the, in the guideline that I will refer to you later. Uh, more considerations, you need to decide if your systems are going to work in parallel or if you are going to replace one system by the other, if paper is there, if you are going to eliminate, if you are going to replicate, and if there are any approval workflows. If you keep all these con considerations in mind when planning your project and you do your proper phases, uh, we believe you can have a very successful implementation and you probably know all of this. And this is just a 
reference to our mobile implementation guidelines. So we have a structure that document, which is in the documentation um, of the HIS2 in the docs page website. We have blocked it in, we have grouped them in depending on the phase where you are. So if you are considering to use the Android app, this is your chapter. If you are already setting up your server, you have recommendations here. If you're testing, you have recommendations here. If you are rolling out, you have recommendations here. And what I have just said in this session is a very, very quick summary of all these documents. So we, we really invite you to go and, and check it out there. I'm going to leave it here. Uh, I know I went very fast, but I hope the basic concepts were transmitted. And over to you, Jaime. I'm a bit over time. Yes, uh, do you mind sharing your slides so we don't stop and it's quicker? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So let me put my camera. So see my entire face after this week. So yeah, let's go with the last part of the, this session before we go to a quick quiz um, to make you chill a bit before the exam. So in terms of devices, now Marta has been explaining how to a bit acquire device um, uh, with that example. I'm gonna quickly talk about a bit more technical things that you should be looking at when acquiring the devices. And this is, uh, you, yeah, perfect, much so. Yeah, actually, maybe I can request control, that's okay. Um, so this is the, something that we have extracted from the official guide that you have down there. I'm not gonna cover uh, it here. Just important to note that depending on your acquisition, in terms you're looking for devices that need to have a keyboard, for example, you will be looking at Chromebooks. We are giving you here the minimum, the minimum requirements or specifications. And have a look. This again is the minimum, but because we say it here, please don't take it uh, like written in stone. You have to test before because maybe we're saying you here with uh, you need at least four gigs of memory for your Chromebook, and then maybe it will work for with less. Uh, maybe you will not have a very good performance, or maybe we tell you between four and eight, and you get a device with uh, four, and then you see it goes very slow because you you have set up a program with hundreds of programs, etc. So ideally, and we'll see in the next slide, we can see that. When you acquire devices, there are things you have to do. And first of all, is that they match the specifications we told you, but then you don't take them like that is exactly. And you say, okay, I'm going to get a little amount of devices. I test them very well with my program already set up. I see how it works. And then I decide to buy more. So I think that's the, the sentence Marta also said. Uh, for me, what I also say is like few test, test, and then the rest. Okay. And another thing that we had to add recently, because in the past, pretty much all every Android device that was being shipped out of factory contained the Google services embedded because Android and Google, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going into this technical discussion, but because now there was a ban two years ago with Huawei, important to know that some devices, if they don't contain the Google services, will not work with the application. So you will get this awful message saying DHS2 training doesn't work because you need Google Play services. By default, it's not gonna impact you, but in case you are thinking to acquire, I think at least so far Huawei devices, you can find a way to a workaround for this, but this can happen. So test, get a little amount of devices, test, and don't find yourself afterwards with a thousand devices that do not work. Next. Please. Yeah, this we saw on the first session, uh, well, on the first day, third session, I think, we discussed the different options. I'm not gonna cover them here again, but uh, for you to know that there are several ways to download it. Most of you went to GitHub to download the training one. We already covered what uh, they were on the first day and I told you I will be talking a bit more. Just wanted to mention that uh, in the next slide, Marta, please. We have this. When you 
decide to install the application from the Google Play, like some of you did, and then you found out that uh, you wanted the training, so you had to go to GitHub to get the training. The important thing to remember is that when you go to the Google Play Store, you cannot control when a new, and a refresh. We, in Oslo, control the Google Play Store. So when we push a new release, we put it in the Google Play so people can download it. Unfortunately, it might be the case that you have a project and you have been explaining people how to use the version 2.5, the one we have now. And then in six months, we release the new version and you are not ready because you didn't test it properly or you didn't give the training because the application has changed a bit and then users will find a different uh, welcome screen, etc. When you use Google Play Store, it's very easy to manage because you don't have to do anything. Uh, most of your devices will um, probably auto update, even though you can disable this and we have guidelines where we, this is explained. But by default, your users will have always the latest version and we control it for most. However, if you use other channels like GitHub or your own market, you control it. So you decide, okay, also people work very hard. They manage to push the 2.6 or the 3.0 version, but I'm not ready. I take my time. I will do it in the future. So when you control your distribution channel, you can act upon this. So it's more difficult to manage, but you have more control. So is there the balance you need to evaluate and decide if you want to go for the easy, but you lose the control a bit or hard, but you have absolute control. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. So um, we have also, uh, uh, I think it's in the, yeah, in the next slide, we will have the, the documentation. Yeah, so sometimes you will be hearing us talking about MDMs or EMM or UMM. They all refer kind of to the same thing, which is a security software that you can use to administer your mobile devices. If you're in an implementation where you have many devices, it might be very difficult to administer those because you, well, in terms of security or because at one point you want to push the application that you have uh, built in your channel or you have decided to build the application to change a specific thing, etc. Uh, doing this without an MDM might be complicated because you need to go to each device or you have to call every user, hey, please pass by the office. We need to update the software. We need to change the application. We need to do this and this. We need to put a pin code, etc. An MDM, basically what it does is you install a piece of software, the same way you install DHIS2 in one server. So you install another thing and you tell all your devices to talk to this server to get, Marta, you're oh. um, Sorry, I don't mind. It's just that I thought you were main sorry, something. So you have your devices down here reading from this server and reading the policy about it saying, okay, I need to have a pin code in my phone. I need to install the new version, et cetera, et cetera. Just a quick concept of this. In the next slide, Marta, if you can show it, please. You will have a reference there that I invite you to read. And basically, if at one point you decide to look at the NDM because you already have an implementation in your country with 1,000 devices, 2,000 devices, and you think this might be interesting, and give me you some key points here that you might look into, we think that it's important for these projects. For example, you want to be able to put a screen lock password. So in the previous session, I talked to you, I explained you how to put a pin code. There's something you need to go to each device to do it. If you could have an NDM, this can be done manually, uh, centrally, and then push trigger to all the devices. Leaving it here for you to, to re go through it afterwards. And the last thing is to know that when you, we have convinced you, after this week of uh, Android Academy, you say, wow, this, oh, I was going to say a uh, bad word. This uh, kicks asses and it's very nice. And I want to implement, uh, I want to use DHIS2 with Android. So I'm going to push to my manager and we have to start using Android. Apart from the implications I was talking about before, security, et cetera, et cetera, there is also something you need to consider and it's from the server side. And I'm saying here the server side because some people believe that it's as simple as buying 100 devices and then started using Android and nothing's going to change. That's not right. And it is because 
when you are working with the web version, you will have someone connected in front of his or her computer, putting patient data, and at this moment, the information goes to the server. If your server was working properly, because you had uh, 10 users, for example, you would expect the same with Android. The thing is, Android, we have been seeing this week that every time you make changes, the changes remain on the phone. And it's only when you sync when this data is sent to the server. So because of the offline capabilities I explained the, in the previous session, we might find ourselves at one point sending a lot of information at the same time to the server. I'm putting here a, a signal. Imagine you have 10 users and they send one letter per day. Uh, and 10 users at the end of the month, we will have uh, 10 users bringing 30 letters. So I don't know if it's very clear, but whatever. This is going every day to the post office, but with Android would be, for example, taking all these letters at the very last moment because our devices synchronize at the same time. So what was being spread among time uh, in terms of information reaching the server with Android might happen that this information, the same information that was like this, instead of being spread on the time, is now sent everything at the same time to the server. So just to remember that when you implement Android, you also need to change, check your server and might be the case that you need to improve your server specifications or you need to tweak your system for Android devices to synchronize at different times, or you could specify policies and say, okay, people from the region A will be syncing on Monday, people from the region B on Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Just quick concepts about this. Uh, the last slide that we have today is the last part of the day, which is called offline, because basically it's one key concept we have been discussing today. So remember that you need to mark your attendance by putting words of the day. So this is the today's one. 